Well, thank you, all for, thank you all for being here. It's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces. My name is Jason Hill. I am the almost decadal host of Suds and Science. I use the he series pronouns. Uh, I am a conservation biologist here at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, the building that you're located in. And welcome to our home right here in White River Junction, the heart of Abenaki country. And it is great to have you here for this uh, penultimate talk of the Suds and Science spring season. So thank you for being here. Uh, is this your first, first talk, first time in Suds and Science? Sydney, you've been here before, and Fred, you've been here many, and you've been, you've been here before, right? Yeah. At the end. Ah, at the end. That's right. Great. Well, thank you for coming back, and welcome to the new folks. Um, it's, I'm, I'm really uh, honored tonight to present Dr. Kate Buckman here from the Connecticut River Conservancy to talk to you about aquatic ecosystems as a, a person who spent their life on the water as a lifelong uh, fisher and fly, fly fisher and angler and vernal pool scounger and someone that enjoys all things aquatic and has so much to learn, um, especially the microscopic side of things. I, it's just a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Buckman here tonight. Kate, welcome to Suds and Science. Thank you. you are welcome to ask questions throughout tonight's presentation and to gauge with our speaker. Um, if you want to know something, yeah, you can wait to the end. You may forget it, so you can lean into and it's meant to be a conversation more than it is a lecture. So please lean in, be engaged, and Kate, welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much um, for having me. Uh, and I will say, um, yes, my name is Kate Buckman. I, my current position is the river steward for New Hampshire at the Connecticut River Conservancy. My talk is not going to center around my work that I do at the Conservancy, although I'm going to bring a little bit of that in, but it's more of a conversation about my experience as an ecologist and um, an aquatic ecologist and a researcher that has worked in both freshwater and marine environments and my journey to get there and what I've learned along the way. And I'm going to start by telling you that one of the big things I've learned along the way is what an impact um, we as human beings have on the environment around us and how part of what I hope for in my job now is that we can take that relationship that we have with the environment and make it mutually beneficial. And as you'll learn throughout my talk, I have worked in a lot of different environments and the, the common thread running through all of them for me is how amazing they are and how in every single one I have seen an impact that humans have had on it. And that can be both negative, which is often what we focus on, as well as beneficial. And I'd like to see that beneficial side keep going up. Um, and so this, for me, is less of a sciencey talk and more of a conversation about what I've done in my life. And so like, like Jason said, I'm happy to take questions along the way. Um, uh, I think uh, I, what did I say the title of my talk was there and back again? So who recognizes what that is from? Anybody? Yes? Yeah. And so. I am from the Shire, New Hampshire. I grew up in Alstead, New Hampshire. I currently live there as well. Um, and I grew up swimming in Lake Warren, which is my local lake, uh, and spending almost every weekend there with my mom and feeling um, just really excited about putting my head underwater and watching things. And I really love fish, and that love has carried me through to today and taken me a lot of different places and exposed me to a lot of different things just because I think these animals are cool, right? And this desire to learn more about them has really helped me to learn more about the world in general, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunities I have had to do that. I also, like many children, was like, I am going to be a marine biologist. <laughs> and I was, grew up in Alston, New Hampshire, which is not on the coast. And my parents, thankfully, indulged that desire in me. They both grew up on Long Island Sound in Connecticut. And my mom always loved the ocean. And she was like, yeah, the ocean is cool. You should study the ocean. My grandparents lived down there. And um, I did bring some props today. 
And so uh, my very first experience with the ocean, I um, made my mother and my grandmother carry me out of it because I saw a jellyfish. And then <laughs> I cried when I got back to my grandparents' house because I had collected an entire bag of mussel shells and left it at the beach. And I'm sure my grandmother was delighted <laughs> that I did not bring all of them home, but I was really sad about it. And I always have to laugh a little bit that that was my first experience with the, with the ocean was this journey where I was like, I'm getting in the ocean, oh my God, the ocean is terrifying and I can't even get myself out of it, right? And then I was like, but I'm going to be a marine biologist. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to pass this around. This is something that reminds me of that first experience with the ocean. And I have had that since college. And when I went to college, I was still determined I was going to be a marine biologist, right? And so I went to a landlocked school. Um, <laughs> and that had a good marine ecology program and was lucky enough to take part in a program that went to Belize and worked with a marine reserve there to survey fish and coral populations. And so um, that was my sort of first research experience of looking at how humans are interacting with the ocean and what we're doing there that can either be beneficial or harmful, right? And so we collaborated with this marine reserve whose goal is to preserve the coral reef and to make it accessible to people. This was a, there's a large tourism industry where I was there too. And so we um, were doing fish and coral surveys both inside and outside of the marine reserve to look at the effect of the reserve on these fish populations. And being a fishy person, I was one of the two women who were doing the fish population surveys. Um, while in college, I also did a study abroad program which took me into the ocean um, sailing on a tall ship and doing a research program out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, and we went to the Sargasso Sea, where for the first time in my life, I saw something called leptocephali. Does anyone know what those are? Yeah, yeah we were talking about them earlier. Um, leptocephali are baby eels, right? And we have eels right out there in the Connecticut River. Um, they are one of our migratory fish species that is important on both the marine and the freshwater side. And I, one of the things I love about these fish is that they really are connecting these two environments and they're a very visceral representation of this connection of what's happening in our watershed and how what we're doing up here in New Hampshire and Vermont can impact something like the Sargasso Sea, which is way out in the middle of the ocean and maybe feels a little out of reach for us. But that is where all of the baby eels grow up. <laughs> and so when I was sailing there, I caught some of these little eels. And the other thing that I love about them is that they are always described as looking like a willow leaf, right? They, have, they are transparent. They're this beautiful, long, pointy shape with these little lines on them. And they do look like a willow leaf. And I really enjoy that sort of um, tie-in of taking something that we're familiar with in an, our environment around here and find something that is so far removed for it and yet also dependent upon where the willows grow, right? And so these little animals are really cool. And I remember being like, this is so amazing that this patch of ocean is the nursery for all of the eels on the eastern seaboard, right? How important is this patch of ocean? If this doesn't exist, if this changes, we have no more eels. <laughs> and it is incredible to think about how the dynamics of what's happening here and what's happening out in the ocean are actually so very much related, right? And what we are doing here on land really does have an impact out there. Um, is there any other animal, like eels are like salmon in reverse? Yes. Is there any other animal that does like that? 
that are tetrams. The eels are the big one that grow up here and then breed in the ocean. Most of the other ones grow up in the ocean and breed in freshwater. Those fish are called anadromous? Anadromous are the ones that they're, they're, um, migrate between the ocean and freshwater. And so you have diadromous and catadromous, and, and that talks about which direction they're going. Yeah. Yep. Kate, where's the Sargasso Sea? The Sargasso Sea is this uh, patch of water <laughs> that is bounded by currents in the Atlantic Ocean. So if you know where Bermuda is, it's sort of, Bermuda is sort of at the bottom of the Sargasso Sea, but because it's a definition, the boundaries of it are currents, it moves around a little bit, right? And it's called that because it's where Sargassum lives, which is that seaweed, which we hear about a lot now, people complaining about because it's washing up on beaches all over the Caribbean and smells terrible when it rots. So, uh, but that seaweed is, creating this entire ecosystem, floating ecosystem in the middle of the ocean. One of the things that happens to hang out there as well are these baby eels. Um, well, there's plastic everywhere, uh, but it is the middle of a gyre, and so you will get accumulation there. What would happen if the seaweed wasn't there? Uh, you would lose an entire ecosystem, right? So it is, it is the basis of it, and so there are, are um, like little sargassum fish, there are invertebrates, and that living in the sargassum seaweed is the only place that they exist. Oh, yeah, so they're cool. They, the, the little fish are, um, they look like the seaweed, so you can't really see them. They've got all these little appendages sticking off of them that look like the leaves on the seaweed. And so the eels, the baby eels, also depend on the seaweed. So that is sort of the nursery ground for them, um, and so they are living in the middle of this gyre. And what is sort of remarkable about that area is literally all of the eels on the eastern seaboard and a whole bunch of ones in Europe all go to this one area to breed. And then the babies disperse back to the different rivers. Are the uh, ones from North America and the ones from Europe the same species? Uh, that's a good question. They are, I mean, they're called European eels and they're called I'm trying to remember off the top of my head if they are all Anguilla rostrata, and I'm, I'm not certain. I'd have to actually look that up, but I think so. Is it just one species? I think so, but don't quote me on that. Well, I, mean, I know I'm being recorded. In the US, is it, are there more than one species to be able to do this, or is it just one? Here, it's just the one species. There are other species of eels, but the Anguilla rostrata, is the, the American eel, is the one that lives in all of our um, rivers here impact, um, if it's known at all, because I've been reading about how um, some of the larger ocean currents, such as AMOC, mm -hmm. um, are weakening, um, or thought to be weakening, due to well, you know, climate change. Really. Yeah. Is that, does that potentially put this ecosystem at risk? I mean, yes, potentially, right? Because what those currents are doing is, is distributing heat. And, and nutrients and other things around the ocean. And so um, I, could, I could come back and do a whole, whole nother talk about ocean circulation, right? And so when you are disrupting that circulation, you're disrupting how um, oxygen goes from the bottom to the top and how the heat is being distributed around too. And so we know, and nutrients as well. And so all of that is sort of the basis of the food chain, right? And so if you're disrupting those sorts of things and you're disrupting the distribution of resources, then that's going to potentially have cascading effects. So the short answer is probably. The long answer is um, also short in that not everything is predictable, but likely. So moving on from college. <laughs> I, uh, so I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean uh, studying these sorts of things in college and in the open ocean, and I was like, yep, still really like the water, still really want to learn more about it. And I ended up, perhaps stubbornly, um, going to graduate school where I moved even farther into the ocean, and I did my PhD thesis studying the ecology of fish that live at hydrothermal vents on the East Pacific rise. 
So I literally went to the bottom of the ocean <laughs> for, my, for my PhD thesis and continued to see all of these connections between the communities that are living there and not only how we study them, but what we're doing um, on the surface that has an impact, right? So we uh, think about these communities that are living down at hydrothermal vents as being sort of separate from us in that they are chemosynthetic, right? So they are not using sunlight as the basis of the energy. They're using the chemicals that are in the hydrothermal fluid and the microbes that are living down there are breaking them down and providing energy, right? And so a lot of the animals that live down there have these amazing symbiotic relationships with microbes where they're actually living internally in them and providing them food and sustenance by breaking down these, these hydrothermal fluids. And they're really remarkable communities. Um, and it's interesting to think about the fact that while they are not dependent on sunlight, they still actually need that sunlight to exist at some point because they do still use oxygen, right? And so that oxygen has to get down to the bottom of the ocean somehow, and ultimately it's coming from up at the top of the ocean. So we're think I'm thinking about like, you know, what we're doing up here, even though we think about these communities as like very, very separate and distinct from what's happening up here, there still is a connection between them. Um, and they are, uh, uh, I feel very privileged to have been able to, to go and study these communities for my PhD thesis. And it was really a remarkable, um, a remarkable time in my life to be able to have that time to just sort of do this work and not have any other responsibilities except to go to sea, <laughs> um, which was really amazing. Uh, at this point in my life, I was like, hmm, I kind of feel like maybe I want to move back to New Hampshire <laughs> and be a little bit closer to my family. And so I ended up spending uh, the next almost 12 years of my life across the river at Dartmouth College, where I did research on um, mostly the trophic transfer of contaminants, particularly metals, particularly mercury, into aquatic food webs, which again, sounds like, whoa, you just sort of made a hard left turn there and we're doing something very different. And the common thread that I see again running through all of this research is this interaction between humans in the environment. And there's a lot more going on there than, than you necessarily think of, right? And so when you're talking about trophic transfer of mercury, which is how mercury is moving through food chains and getting into the fish that people eat, where's that mercury coming from in the first place, right? And a lot of that has to do with human actions of how it's getting out into the environment. I was lucky enough to work actually with some folks here at VCE on a project looking at mercury in Verna pools while I was doing that work. Um, and I moved a little bit shallower in that a lot of our work was working in estuaries there as well. Um, and so I did freshwater and salty, salty work while I was at Dartmouth looking at uh, what environmental processes are causing some areas to have higher bioaccumulation of mercury in fish than in other areas that sort of look similar. Mm -hmm. How does mercury get into a vernal pool? So, good question. <laughs> um, the question, if you didn't hear it, was how does mercury get into a vernal pool? And here in New England, a lot of the mercury that gets into the environment is actually from atmospheric deposition, right? And so in the vernal pool environment, you have mercury that's getting deposited onto leaves and or pine needles, and those are falling to the forest floor, right? And then it, the snow melts and it rains in the spring, and you have water coming in and filling up those vernal pools. And so there's this interesting dynamic that happens with mercury where when you get wetting and drying, it can actually liberate more mercury and make it available to, again, microbes, which are transforming it from one form of mercury into another form of mercury that's more bioavailable, so it more easily gets into living tissues. Short answer, comes from the sky. <laughs> So a lot of different ways. A major one in the United States um, is actually coal-fired power plants. And so 
historically burning medical waste put a lot of it in. There are point sources of pollution of mercury too. So um, we used to have like chloralkali facilities uh, that used mercury in the process of making bleach um, in order to bleach paper at paper mills, right? And so those could be a point source of, of mercury pollution to the environment. But uh, uh, yes, for the most part, like we are, you know, the bow coal plant is probably shutting down um, soon, maybe. I may have read a headline about that. Yes, so yes. Um, there is still, however, legacy mercury inputs in the environment, right? So unless that mercury is removed from the cycle, it has the ability to, to get back into it, right? And so um, me like many contaminants, the goal is to eliminate it at its source. So a lot of people talk about PFAS now, right? And that, unlike mercury, is not a naturally occurring element. We made that. Um, and the only way to get it out of the environment is to not put it in the environment in the first place. And so that, again, is one of those interactions that I keep seeing popping up in my study of aquatic ecology of, hey, I really love animals that live in water, right? And what are we doing to animals that live in water that are either positive or negative? And in, in some cases, through things like pollution and contaminants, that's a negative impact. And other things, you know, in my current job, we host a uh, source to sea cleanup every fall where volunteers go out and pick up garbage out of, the, out of the river. That's a positive impact that people are having on the environment. They're removing a potential source of contamination, right? And, and doing something that is beneficial. And so in moving from hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean to estuaries and rivers in New Hampshire and looking at, at uh, mercury, there's this continuing thread that I have of looking at how all of these pieces of the environment, including humans, fit together. And one of the things that I really, really loved about oceanography was, and particularly hydrothermal vent studies, is that you can't understand it in isolation. And that may actually be my favorite thing about ecology in general is that it really is all tied to together. That's, that's the whole point of ecology, right? It's a system and one thing impacts another. And what I really loved about my thesis work with fish that live at hydrothermal vents is I couldn't understand what was happening with the fish unless I understood the geology of the system, which was driving the chemistry of the system, which was driving the ecology of the system. And so this sort of holistic view of looking at the bigger picture rather than just looking at one little tiny component, and we as humans are part of that bigger picture, was sort of this common thread running through all of that. I've now ended up <laughs> at an organization where my primary role is advocacy. And so I am now an environmental advocate working on behalf of the river and river communities to try and improve the health of the river and make this relationship between the environment and the people that live at it sort of um, mutually beneficial and uplifting each other, right? And I can't, it's, it is weird to me this was not my goal at the beginning of my career, right? That I ended up living in the same town that I grew up in. I bought a house a mile up the road from my parents. <laughs> um, and I literally went around the world, ended up in the same place. And all of these experiences that I had studying animals that live in water have all influenced each other and had a common thread running through them of the power of understanding relationships and whether that relationship is between a rock and a fish or that relationship is between a human and a dam or that relationship is between different organizations or different organisms, right? Those relationships um, are sort of the foundation of our understanding of how the world works and that throughout my career, I think, has become somewhat more important for me to recognize that it is these relationships, and whether that's an ecological or an environmental relationship or a human relationship, that is the driving force behind the good we can do in the world on behalf of our environment. And that's been really 
powerful for me to recognize over the years. And so um, this is sort of a weird, weird talk about me <laughs> um, in a lot of different environments that in the end have brought me back to the place I started and ultimately are all tied into it as well. I can tell you that some of these relationships are negative, right? I dove on um, the North Atlantic Seamounts, which are mountains literally in the, uh, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, on a cruise that was um, studying corals, and I saw a mylar balloon on the bottom of the ocean, right? That's always a little disappointing to see. And then the photo that was uh, posted with the ad for this talk is my colleague Kathy and I were out um, counting baby shad in the river last fall to try and help understand what's going on with these populations of fish right here that also are tied to the ocean, right? And so I'd, I'm trying not to be like too heavy handed with this, but um, my life personally and my career has really drawn this connection of connection between all of us and that we, we really can make a difference in our little place in the world that might have a difference in the bigger part of the world as well. And so I brought um, some more show and tell items here uh, just to sort of talk about this a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to pass these out and I'm going to have you tell me what you think they are and where they came from. Yeah, go for it. They're not very accessible. They're way down there, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> like how deep are they? Um, like the ones that I typically went to were around 2,500 meters. How did you get down there? In a submarine. <laughs> you swam. Yeah, I did not swim. No. Here, you can have one too. So I did work in both the Pacific and in the Atlantic. Most of my thesis work was on the East Pacific rise. So. If you go to Manzanillo, Mexico, and drive 500 miles west into the ocean, it's underneath you there. Um, but I also did some work on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and then um, the New England Seamount chain, and also uh, farther south in the Pacific Ocean as well. Does that ridge, which goes like top to bottom of the Earth, does yep. that have hydrothermal vents all, all along it? They are scattered all along it, and so they exist where there is a, a melt lens close enough to the surface that seawater can interact with, with the melt lens and be fundamentally changed into hydrothermal fluid and then come back up. And so you have these really interesting biogeographic provinces in the different oceans where you get different animals that are living at the different ridges um, because the chemistry is controlled by the spreading rate of the mid-ocean ridge, right? So the mid-Atlantic ridge is a slow spreading ridge, the East Pacific rise is a fast spreading ridge, and that ultimately determines the character of the vents and then the organisms that live there. Yeah. Yes? I've uh, heard it said that the most likely place to find life um, outside of uh, planet Earth is going to be in uh, hydrothermal vents on some of the moons of uh, Jupiter and or Saturn. Yeah, I, um, I don't know a lot about space. <laughs> um, I have tended to keep myself on Earth uh, for, for most of my knowledge, but there is a lot of overlap between sort of the fields of astrobiology and people that do study hydrothermal vents because of the unique environment at hydrothermal vents and the, um, the sort of hypotheses of how that environment can be related to sort of the building blocks of life, right? Did the animals that you find there, mm -hmm. did they evolve in that environment from the get-go or did they drop down from the... Surface of you the know, Earth. that's a really good question. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know more about the extant ecology of them than I do the evolution of them. Some of the more advanced ones, yeah. or whatever, or even 
I will tell you, and this relates to what I'm passing around, <laughs> is that they do have sort of um, characteristics of organisms that we find in other parts of the ocean, right? And so whether that is convergent evolution in totally different places or whether they are actually related, I can't speak to that. But so what do you guys have? <laughs> what did I give you? Muscle shells. Muscle shells, right? Clam shell? Um, also a muscle shell. So muscle shell? everything I gave you is a muscle shell. Um, and let's see, where should we start with, which, who has, let me see which one I have somewhere. Um, we'll start with a familiar one, perhaps, these guys. So, do we recognize these? Yeah, exactly. This did not come from a restaurant, but it might have. Yeah, so this is our middleus edulis, which is our intertidal blue mussel. Very familiar. You probably have eaten it. Um, I collected these when I was doing intertidal work at Dartmouth. Um, and this guy, does this one look familiar as well? Yeah. Yeah, that's ocean. yeah so this is, lives in the same place. This is Gucensia demissa. This is the ribbed mussel. Um, and so both of these ones live in intertidal areas. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that is the, the area on the coast where the tide goes up and down, right? And so it's the intertidal is in between high tide and low tide. Um, and so it's the area that is intermittently covered by water. Without the ribs, that's considered most desirable to eat. That's when it's fun. I actually don't eat seafood, <laughs> but um, this is, according to all my sources, a tasty mussel. So yeah, yeah. Um, okay, next one. That one and this one are the same. Where do you think they came from? Atlantic Ocean? Fresh water. Well, I've heard guesses of every place I've been. <laughs> um, what was that? Antarctica. Not Antarctica. I have not been there. So these two are just two different sizes of um, Bathymodiolus thermophilus, which is the mussel that lives at hydrothermal vents on the East Pacific rise. Cool thing about these guys, they have bacteria, symbiotic bacteria that live in their gills and they are helping to produce energy for these mussels. While these guys can filter feed like these guys do, they don't have to. Um, and so a lot of their food is actually produced by the symbiotic bacteria that are living in their gills. And so they are dependent upon the hydrothermal fluids, which are feeding those symbionts. So they can't survive outside that environment. Correct. Yep, so hydrogen sulfide um, is that source of energy. Um, there are also methanogens, um, and so there are bacteria that use methane as well. This guy is another hydrothermal vent one. This is Bathymodiolus azoricus, so these guys live on the mid-Atlantic ridge. And they are related to these ones, but not the same species. Um, and all of the ones that I have shown you so far are all um, considered middleids. They're, they're all within the same um, order of mussels, and so they're all middleids. And so who has mussels that are left? That one, and there's just maybe one other little guy over there. What do we think these are? Eastern ding, ding, ding. <laughs> These mussels came out of the Connecticut River, right? So these are one of our native freshwater mussels. These are the very common ones, Eastern Elliptio. There are like 12 species of mussels that live in the Connecticut River. Something like eight or nine of them are either endangered or threatened. These ones are the most common one you're gonna find. And remember how I talked about the symbiotic relationship with the bacteria in the hydrothermal vent mussels? 
These guys have another really cool relationship that's a little bit different um, in that these mussels are dependent upon host fish to disperse themselves. So this little pile of mussels, all of these guys are broadcast spawners. They just squirt it out into the ocean, let the currents take it where it will, and hope it lands in a hospitable place. Were our river mussels to do that, where would all the baby mussels end up? Downstream. Yeah, downstream. There's only one direction to go, right? And so our freshwater mussels actually have a different reproductive mode in that they, the female takes the sperm internally and fertilizes it internally, and then they pop out little baby mussels, and they are in a phase called a glochidia, and that glochidia attaches onto the gills of a specific host fish for that mussel species. And that host fish swims around with a baby baby mussel insisted in its gill and takes it, transports it around, and that's how we get dispersal of mussels in the river, right, is through these fish carrying them around in their gills. Mm -hmm. That glochidia exists, so it pops out of the gill at some point and is hopefully landing in an environment that is correct for that species. And that's one of the challenges for these mussels is that the different species of mussels have different host fish and some of them are very specific, like the endangered dwarf wedge mussel depends on the tessellated darter and the slimy sculpin as its host fish, whereas some of them, like the eastern elliptio, are pretty generalist, and those glochidia will glom onto whatever fish happens to be swimming by at the moment. There are ones that are dependent upon salmonids, and so brook trout are a big host for them, and we have issues with climate change, changing the temperature of the streams, which impacts where brook trout can live, um, and thus impacts the mussel population too. And then we have other ones that are dependent upon our shad and our herring. So if you're not getting those fish migrating where they should be in the river, you're also not getting that mussel population dispersing. And so I actually spent the entire morning today talking about mussels <laughs> at Dartmouth. Um, and uh, uh, the potential for what mussels do in our river and whether maybe we could do a mussel restoration program. And it's again, one of those things that for me is just driving home the like really um, powerful relationships that exist with water and within water. And I always come back to thinking about like, what is the thing that is the most unique about Earth? us, but could we exist without, what are we always looking for on other planets? Water, right? And so it is, has been this lifelong fascination for me of stuff that lives in water and realizing as I'm going through each stage of my career, how really cool it is what's happening underwater and all of these things that are connected across our planet because of water. Um, and so I've blathered on for farther than I intended to, <laughs> which is fine, but I'm happy to um, take any questions about all of this. And I actually am, would invite discussion about um, what, what your relationship with our water around us is and how, how you view um, both how it impacts you and how you impact it and think about that as you sally forth into the world. Are there any freshwater mussels? that use life forms other than fish for transport? Not that I know of, at least not here. The mussels that live at the hydrothermal vent. Yep. What's a baby mussel called, a larva? Yes. Okay, can that travel between the vents? Yeah, so it's dependent upon currents and it's really interesting. Um, they sort of go for the power of numbers, right? Uh, they put so many mussel larvae out there in the hopes that they are going to end in a hospitable Genetic exchange. Yeah. Yeah, and so there is, and the, some of them are really, really long-lived in sort of the slow-spreading ridge system. You get the vents that are active for thousands of years, whereas the ones on the East Pacific rise are pretty ephemeral in terms of geologic time. They sort of pop up, then they go away. And in fact, I actually ended up having to um, rethink my entire thesis because as I was about to defend my proposal, 
um, to do research, there was an eruption at our vent field that paved over everything else. And so it was a really unique opportunity to look at sort of recolonization. And things come back faster than I had expected that they would. Um, so yeah, they do, they sort of put a lot out there and it's, it's totally currents that are carrying them around and they need to end up in a place that they, the, the hydrothermal fluids are so they can stay there. <laughs> they are different, um, phylogenetically different, right? And so even the freshwater mussels in these marine mussels, I said these ones are mytilids, these are unionids. And so they are even different orders of mussels, and clams are totally separate from that as well. So they look similar in that they're all bivalves, and they all are bivalves. But then when you parse it out from there, they become separate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking that uh, I drive across the White River every day. Yep. And that most of our lives are built around avoiding water. Yep. Getting over it to the other side, controlling it during flooding. Yep. Getting rid of it. Um, can cities be designed in a way to enable people to interact with, 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 with water? I don't see why not, <laughs> right? Yes. And well, I think... Yeah, sure, yeah, right. Yeah. Amsterdam, Venice. Uh, um. And I think part of that is just a thought, and we're even talking about that now, right? Like, we in New England, and particularly here in parts of Vermont and New Hampshire, are, are going, are, and are going to continue to be um, a place where climate refugees are going to want to come, right? We are, know we have a housing shortage, so how do we think about thoughtfully designing, providing housing for people who are here and who we know are going to come here in a way that doesn't exacerbate our issues with building and floodplains in this interaction with water, right? And so there's, I think, yes, the answer is yes, we absolutely have the capability to do that. We just need to think about it and implement it. You should think about, like, in some ways, limiting access to water. Uh, as canoers, we do a lot of different places in the introduction of exotic species. Yep. It's a huge yep. problem. It's devastating. Yep. devastating. Yep. Some yep. places some are still places pristine. Are still yes. Fewer every day, yes. it seems, and those should be, access should be controlled somehow to keep these exotic species out there, which have a devastating effect on the, uh, the local environment. Yeah, they definitely, yeah, they definitely can. Can. Can, do can do that. Restricting access to boating and so on. I mean, once it's contaminated, that's it. But um, there's still smaller lakes and ponds that are not yeah. contaminated yeah. with some of these exotic species. And I just don't think there's any way to uncontaminate them. Yeah. Yeah. That is a big challenge. That is a big challenge. <laughs> and I will say my coworker, uh, the river steward in Connecticut, that is a large part of her job is dealing with um, aquatic plants that are problematic down there. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? What are brook trout like? What are brook trout like? What do brook trout like? Oh, what they like cold water. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, they like, depending upon their li life stage, they like sort of fast-running, fast riffly areas that have some pools that they can swim in, particularly when they get bitter, bigger as well. And so you'll often find them in sort of your um, lower order streams that are higher up, right? And so that you have the colder, faster running water there. They like eating insects. <laughs> um, but one of the big things for them is that they do need cold water above a certain temperature they can't live in it. Is there, is, would that be like, what exactly? I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there is actually a limit, yeah, yeah. It's more oxygen, isn't it? Um, it? They're related, right? There's an inverse relationship there, right? Where colder water can cover, can hold more oxygen um, than warmer water can. So if you're always going to have more oxygen in colder water. Yeah, I think they probably wouldn't be happy per se, but they would be alive. That's a whole nother conversation about <laughs> happiness of fish. <laughs> I, I've been reading uh, articles about um, projects to reintroduce the beaver to rivers in England and other places yep. like that. 
And uh, what, what impact is that going to have, say, on mussels and other aquatic life on any of those rivers? Yeah, so that's an interesting question in general in that I think we are collectively terrible at predicting what effects things are going to have. Um, in both good and bad ways, like sometimes there's a positive effect that we wouldn't necessarily know about. But so beavers are really interesting ecosystem engineers, right? And um, when they have done sort of, um, so there's been some beaver, beaver dam analogs that have been deliberately built to create the equivalent of a beaver swamp and then we also know what beavers do right and so they have a natural process that they are creating and so these mussels all have specific habitats that they like to live in and so um there aren't that many that would be found specifically in a swamp per se. Um, and so they may not be eliminating mussel habitat, but are creating habitat for other organisms as well, as well as, you know, making a wetland, which I personally love, <laughs> um, and has a lot of ecosystem benefits in terms of groundwater recharge and the whole uh, slowing and spreading and sinking of floodwaters as well. Um, so I, I, I can't answer that question in that I can't predict what reintroducing a beaver in England is gonna do to their, to their river systems. And I think it is also very dependent upon what that river system looks like now too. And so there's gonna be different effects in um, one that has been potentially highly channelized already uh, versus one that is a little, in a little bit of a more natural state to begin with. And so, um, if you do want to know more, I should have brought them in. If you want to know more about the mussels, I actually have a book in the car that you can have <laughs> um, that is all about mussels in the Connecticut River, and, it, and you can uh, learn a lot about the different species and what their specific habitat requirements are in that. So happy to give you one if you really want to know. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I have a beaver. Oh, I wish. <laughs> Actually, I probably would not want the beaver in the car, but <laughs> they are delightful animals. <laughs> so, yeah. One question about the mussels. Yeah. A lot of places of water quality has improved greatly. Yep. So would reintroduction of mussels be possible now in certain places? Yeah, and so there's a lot of things that go, that go into that, right? And so a lot of different considerations. One of the big impacts of the dams, right? is that they have completely altered sediment transport in the river too. And so there may be areas that the water quality is good enough, but the water movement and what's happening in the benthos, so what the, the bottom surface is now, is no longer hospitable for a particular mussel species. But, but some have such a tiny known range, what do you have to lose trying to reintroduce it? Somewhere? Yeah, that's the question. Mm -hmm. You might not have anything to lose. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so the mussels actually help improve water quality as well. And so it's sort of, you know, if you got good enough water quality that they can live there, they're just going to help make it better because they filter so much water um, as they're feeding. But that is actually one of the projects we're working on with the Dartmouth Social Impact Practicum is the students are sort of having a thought experiment about like what would it mean and how would you go about reintroducing muscles and so thinking about some of those exact questions of like what do you have to lose versus what do you have to gain and what are the logistics of actually implementing that given that a lot of these species are threatened or endangered um, so yeah good question we're thinking about it too <laughs> but does that mean like yeah, like maybe you would use a trout in the classroom model type of thing. Maybe you would grow them in a hatchery. These are all like, so they have a muscle reintroduction program that, um, I forget if it's in the Potomac or the Anacostia, uh, that has been somewhat successful. And so maybe that would be a model and may maybe we would look at a different model for doing it here. And it might look different depending upon the species that you're trying to introduce as well. And then again, because they have this cool relationship with the fish, you got to think bigger. It's not just the mussels, right? You got to make sure that their host species is there as well, which is really sort of both daunting and fun to think about. Do, do they have any, uh, it makes me think of, uh, you know, these uh, three-host parasitic systems. 
are there parasites that use the muscles to in a, to gain access to the fish? As yeah, I don't know. Cycle host. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. For the muscles that are endangered or threatened, do we know why? Like, do we know what they need? Do we know what the limiting factor is or what the cause of their? So, I mean, the Connecticut River is interesting in that you know it was first dammed in the late 1700s, right? So we have had an impact on how the river has been flowing since then. Um, and so we do, like the dwarf wedge mussel, we know where some populations of it are, and they're doing okay where they are. Um, and so, for the most part. Um, so to an extent, yes, we do know something about what they, what they need. Um, but it is challenging in that we literally regulate the entire length of the river to ensure that that habitat exists everywhere, right? And so that's part of, um, like I said, my, my colleague Kathy is talking down the road about hydro relicensing tonight. <laughs> um, and that's part of that going into that thought process of what are we advocating for in a new license, right? Is like, how are these changes in operation potentially gonna open up new habitat or not? And the hope is that if you move toward a more naturally flowing river system, that's gonna restore these natural processes of sediment transport and constantly flowing water and is gonna open up habitat that may have been um, closed off to many species, including mussels, by how we have operated the river for the last however many years. This last license was like 40 plus years, and, but there have been dams in the river for hundreds of years. So, yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? I do want to, why, why are, they, why are the, the, the leases, leases? Yeah, um, the licenses, licenses. Why yeah. So for, they, I perceive them as really long. They are really long, yeah. <laughs> They, it actually has to do, and um, I don't fully understand it, but it has to do with how they calculate return on investment of the facilities. So it, it has more to do with financial terms than it does environmental terms. And so that's, that's baked into the FERC process of there's this calculation in the laws that govern how you, how you give licenses that calculate. Um, how how that return on investment and how long that license can be. And, and in between the licensing period, is there opportunity to Im influence change at higher facility, or do they just have to wait until the Yeah, so it's really hard to crack a license open once it's been granted, yeah. unless there is a specific provision, like an article in that license that says, mm -hmm. if this happens, we need to return to this, right? And so otherwise it's really, really difficult to alter that until the next period of renewal for it. Yeah, which is literally a lifetime so <laughs> for some things, yeah. Yeah. Any other last parting questions? You're kicking yourself the whole way home. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention and um, your questions and your engagement. And it's always lovely to chat with people who appreciate um, what organizations like VCE and CRC do. So will thanks. You, will you stick around for a minute? And, yeah, and, absolutely. And um, thank you to Jordan behind the camera and our friends at Jan at Downtown River Junction. Thank you to the National Science Foundation for providing funding for tonight's uh, recording of Says in Science and for Dan Olson and Dartmouth for assistance to that. Thank you all for attending. Please raid the table of food on the way out. <laughs> you don't have to run out. Help yourself. And hi, Mom. And see you next month. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.